Hello and welcome. My name is Paweł Dłotko. I'm the director of the Oskuri Center in Topological Data Analysis at the Mathematical Institute of Polish Academy of Sciences. Today, I want to talk to you about certain ideas of geometry and topology, which can be used to understand data, which can in particular be used to understand the data that are dynamics. And um, before we actually kick in with the presentation, I would like to thank the organizers for setting up this event in this difficult time and uh, for giving me a chance to speak. Big thank to you. Okay, so today we'll focus on uh, geometry and topology of data, of the dynamical data, and we'll try to take a look at those data from two different perspectives. Um, the first one, kind of more obvious one, in which we'll use the geometrical and topological invariants uh, of certain classical models uh, to detect phases in those models and to detect transitions between phases in those models. Once we have a good grasp on that, we'll move into an idea of building geometrical and topological based models of data. In the second case, we kind of assume that there is no analytical solution that, that is known to us and we want to use some simple ideas from geometry and topology to try to have a reasonable working predictive model of the data. Let us start with a simple case, which is, which is a kanahiliad cook equation that models a phase separation in alloys. So what is the story? Well, suppose that we have a binary alloy, so an alloy that uh, contains two uh, elements, say a ferrium and, and chromium, and um, well, if the alloy is of a good quality, that means that the density of each of the components, each of the two components, is uniform across the, 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 the alloy. Um, however, once you start to heat it up and cool it down many, many times, then you will get a phase separation. And uh, well, we'll see some pictures in the next slide. Um, but there is a standard model of this phenomena. This is a Kala-Hilliard model. Um, the, the component given by Cook is uh, the last term over here, which is this random fluctuation term. And essentially, the, the variable we are looking at, the change of the variable, is, the, is the, this variable u, which is the difference between the density of, of the first component, which is, which is denoted by a, and the second component, which is denoted by b. And this, this variable u essentially is measuring locally what is the difference between the concentrations of those two connected components. The term f, well, it can be a given continuous function. In our case, it is this degree for polynomial, and well, this is a stochastic uh, partial differential equation, so we have this, this random fluctuation there. So let us take a look at um, some of the numerical solutions of this equation we got starting from a unit square. So let us take a look at a few numerical solutions of this equation. And um, this one is obtained for the proportion of masses of the two components being the same, because essentially 50-50 proportion of masses. So, how to interpret this image, first of all? Once you look at the white region, it means that the concentration of one of the materials, say first, for the sake of argument, is 100% uh, in that region. Once you see a black region in this picture, it means that the concentration of the second material is 100%. And obviously, at the beginning of the simulation, somewhere around uh, now, we start from uniform mixing with some minimal random fluctuations. And uh, as the process of the phase separation progress, we are getting this snake-like behavior. Obviously, because the equation is stochastic, we'll never get uh, the same picture twice. But for this proportion of masses, we, we kind of see this snake-like behavior, snakes of black or white components. Let us take a look at um, the second case in which we have a proportion of masses being 60-40, so 60% of one material and 40% of, of the others. 
Now, we still see a little bit of the snake be type behavior, but we, we see also many more connected components. And we are getting closer to this droplet regime where uh, the black material, which is uh, the material with the 40% of, of the, de which occupies 40% of the density, it kinds of form into a collection of drops. Again, this is one of the typical solutions which we can encounter. Moving forward to 75% uh, of uh, white material versus 25% uh, of, of black material, we, we are already in this, in this droplet phase where uh, the material which is not dominant, it will form itself during the process into this collection of drops and the smaller one will dis disappear, the larger ones will become larger as the material, as material will be great to it. So, you know, those are three different phases, the snake-like phase, the droplet phase and the, the intermediate phase. And there is really no phase transition in between them, but we can see this, this phenomena in the stochastic equation. The point is that we will never get the same solution, but there are certain topological characteristics that we can get out of it that uh, help us to quantify in which state we are. So let us try to understand how we can use topology in order to try to understand the pictures which we just saw. So this, those pictures really represent the evolution of the solution of the equation throughout the time. Now, we will not look at the continuous collection of times, we will discretize our time domain into a grid from T1 to Tn. And for every, um, uh, for, for every time in the grid, TTI, uh, the solution will be a function from R2 into R. In fact, from a compact subset of R2, namely a unit square. And the value at every given point of this unit square will tell us what is the proportion of masses uh, at this point and its immediate neighbors. So looking at a such such a function from a perspective of topology or persistent homology, um, well, we can discretize it using a cubical complex. And we can compute persistent homology of the obtained um, grayscale image. To be precise, we'll filter our cubical complex from the lowest to the highest uh, values of, of, of the pixels, and we'll use a persistence diagram in order to track how the connected components in one-dimensional cycles are changing once we increase the value of the filtration, the value of the grayscale level. And uh, so what we are doing is um, we'll obtain for every fixed time of our solution a persistence diagram in dimension 0 and in dimension 1 that characterize this solution at a given time. So, a whole solution is characterized by a sequence of persistence diagrams, one for each time step. And, uh, well, so for every fixed proportion of masses, we'll run many, uh, many numerical simulations, we'll get many solutions, and for each of them, we'll get this vector of persistence diagrams in dimension 0 and 1. We'll not restrict ourselves only to uh, a fixed proportion of masses will actually vary the proportion of masses to be able to see how those vectors of persistence diagrams can potentially be used to characterize different phases in that model. Um, so for each fixed proportion of masses, we will want to understand what is the average behavior. And in order to do this, we will compute an average persistent homology descriptor in dimensions 0 and 1. Um, if you know topological data analysis, you probably know that the concept of averaging of persistence diagram, while it exists in a form of a fresher mean, it's not uniquely defined. In order to have it uniquely defined, we'll actually translate the persistence diagrams we obtain into persistent landscapes and we'll average persistent landscapes. So, once we are done with this whole procedure, we'll have a vector, so for every fixed proportion of masses, we'll have a vector of averaged persistent landscape that kind of characterize the typical evolution for this proportion of masses. And we can use it 
um, as a simple classifier. So for instance, once we have a new solution coming in, we can turn it to persistence diagrams and subsequently into persistent landscapes. And look for the closest vector uh, from our training set of averaged uh, persistent landscapes of, of the solutions from different proportion of masses. And the one which will be closest to, to our new uh, trajectory, to our new solution, uh, is quite likely uh, to have the same proportion of masses as our new candidate. And actually, if we use it as a classifier, uh, we immediately realize that, that this, this is perfectly accurate. And, uh, well, what does it tell us is essentially that uh, those averaged persistence descriptors really carries a lot of information about not only the geometry of the solutions, but also about the the parameters of our equation. And uh, those are just the sample average persistence images. The, the, the first one is for, for the proportion of masses 50-50, the second one is for 60-40, uh, and the, the, the last one is for, for, the, for the droplet behavior. And, you know, the pictures are in the same scale, so, so we can really see that the averaged solutions are very, very different. If we actually fill in the, 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 the picture of, 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 of the more dense grid of uh, different proportion of masses, we'll see a continuous transitions between them. So, once again, there is no phase transitions, but the phases are kind of continuously swapping from this snake-like behavior into the drop-like behavior. So, this is one of many examples which you can find in the literature um, of the case where topology gives a way to recognize certain parameters of the model, phases of the model, um, at the moment, we are working to use those ideas, to, to, to compare models, to verify the model against the real data, and hopefully, quite soon, we'll have something new to report to you. So, looking at the Kanahilat cook model, again, it's one of the examples where topology can be detected, to, can be used to characterize certain phases of matter. In the, what follows, I'm going to show you an example in which uh, topology of the configuration spaces can be used to detect transitions between phases. And uh, for that purpose we'll play with the most prototypical model in statistical mechanics, namely the Ising model. So, it's a very simple model in which, uh, well, in that particular case we will have a finite grid of elements in dimension D, so we have a d-dimensional uniform grid, and that every grid element will have a spin, which will be either positive or negative. And uh, here we have the Hamiltonian of that system. Um, the second component is really um, corresponding to external magnetic field, and the first component is responsible for the coupling of the neighboring spins. So, in the cubical grids in dimension 2, Every grid element will have four neighbors, the one above, below, to the left, and to the right. And uh, this coupling, well, it will want, it will favorize the spins which are aligned among their neighbors. So, that's a very, very simple model in statistical physics. It turned out to be extremely important in understanding various phases, phase transitions. It, it's used in, in many domains, uh, starting from really theoretical physics, but also going to neuroscience to understand brains uh, and the dynamics of the brain to, to understand financial markets, etc. etc. And that, that's why it, it's a good toy to play. So, you can think about it in one-dimensional case, where you only have one-dimensional grid of points, and uh, this one do not have a phase transition, which is a result by Ising himself from 1920s. Um, Two-dimensional case have a phase transition, that means a phase transition, which was proven in uh, late 1940s. And again, those two are rigorous results, so, so we really have proofs that this phase transition is not or is over there. Um, so suppose we take a number of two-dimensional Ising configuration, and we start to apply 
topological tools to it. Uh, so over here on the left, um, I computed the average zero-dimensional Betty number of a number of configurations. And on the right-hand side, I compute an average first Betty number for, for the same uh, collection of two-dimensional configurations. They are ordered in the x-axis by the energy or the, or the temperature or the value of the Hamiltonian. So as you see, as, as, as the, the temperature increase, uh, shortly after two, we, we, we kind of see a uh, something which may look like a discontinuity uh, in the both zero and first Betty number curve. And uh, well, the value of the, the critical temperature for that grid is <clears throat> well very close uh, to you know two point something. So it seems that uh, we are really capturing some sort of discontinuity in the place where we would expect to see it, right? Um, when it comes to dimension three, there is no proof. Of a, of a phase transition. However, there, there are multiple numerical experiments that indicates uh, that this phase transition is happening over there and they, they have a pretty good understanding where it's supposed to be. But again, those results are purely numerical. When it comes to dimension 4 and higher, there is a phase transition and again, this result has been rigorously proven. So, if we look at Three-dimensionalizing model, you know, the, the one which is perhaps the, the most interesting because not everything is known uh, precisely rigorously. Again, we see something, some discontinuity in uh, Betty number curves. So, so the blue one is, is, is the zero Betty numbers, the, the, uh, the yellow one is the first and the, the red one is the second Betty numbers. And we see that something is, is really happening in between the, the, the temperature values 3 and, and, and 4, that there are some discontinuities. Um, again, they are not very well localized in that picture, as they used to be, for instance, for the two-dimensional picture, because the, the, the configurations which we are looking at over here are quite small, and uh, the, the phase transition is the phenomena which really should happen once we take uh, you know, the, the size of the configuration going to, to infinity. And once we, once we take larger and larger grids, then we expect to see some sort of vocalization of those discontinuities in better numbers. Well, however, this is again purely numerical result and, and in fact very naive. So, so what I did over here was, was to take a bunch of, of solutions from, from, from you know, off-the-shelf uh, implementation that provides configuration of Ising model and um, you do not have any rigor which uh, is required by, by, by the statistical physics uh, community. And in order to make it a little bit rigorous, um, I actually got involved uh, two people, Biagio and uh, Davide, who, who are working in statistical physics, as well as Takshing, who, uh, who used to be my postdoc at Swansea uh, University, who is an expert in, in machine learning. And uh, what we try to do is to, is, is to actually align it better into the, uh, into the frame of, of statistical physics. But before we do this, there are certain details, certain loose ends that we need to tie up. And um, first of them is, uh, well, we really need to answer the question, what is a positive spin? Because the um, when I was computing Betty numbers, I actually took the positive complex and I took the Betty numbers of the positive complex. The problem is that the positive spin is not something which is uh, canonically defined. And that may be causing uh, some problems. So in the configuration, for instance, in the configuration on the left, where I have certain positive sp spins uh, yeah, in the boundary of this 3x3 configuration and the negative spins is sit in the middle. Uh, well, if I compute the standard Betty numbers of this configuration, well, the positive complex certainly have one connected component and one cycle in dimension one. Um, so the vector of Betty numbers will be one and one. One for, them, one for dimension 0 and one for dimension 1. But if I take an, a configuration which is equivalent from the statistical physics perspective, which is the one on, on, on the right-hand side, where I just swapped positive plus to minuses and vice versa, uh, if I take the positive complex, it will have only one connected component uh, and no holes. So the vector of Betty numbers will be 1 
and zero. So, well, we need some sort of, some way of measuring Betty numbers or whatever topological information we want to get out of those configurations, which is kind of invariant in some sense with respect to swapping of the spins. Now, if we take just the Betty numbers of those configurations, they are clearly not invariant. Now, if you look at this and think for a moment, you'll probably realize that if I take, if I introduce a periodic boundary conditions, uh, then perhaps you know, certain problems can be fixed. However, none of them, uh, not all of them, will be. And this is because uh, we are really looking at um, objects which are more uh, tied to the field of digital topology and over there certain dualities do not hold. And let me be a little bit more precise on that. So let me take this configuration, this is 3x4 configuration over here with a uh, you know, certain number of positive spins which are, which are marked with this brownish uh, color and uh, you know a bunch of negative configurations. And uh, if I consider a positive complex over here, well it will have again one connected component and one cycle. And I will have the cycle over here because well my, my, my positive complex in order to reintroduce homology I need to take a closed uh, complex. Namely, there will be a connection to this corner over here. So I will have a one-dimensional cycle. Uh, however, if I take a negative complex in instead, or formally if I swap the, spine, the, 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 the spines and um, I'll consider negative instead of positive complex, well, this complex will also be uh, closed and therefore this cell will be connected to that cell throughout this point in the middle. That really shows that we don't have a jordan curve theorem or we don't have certain dualities which we would expect uh, from standard topology, well, they do not carry over to this cubical world. And um, that is causing us certain problems um, if we want to have an invariance with respect to swapping spins. And in order to deal with that and actually also make uh, this topological invariance somewhat closer to uh, the standard statistical physics, we decided to use uh, one uh, real number as a descriptor, as a topological descriptor of the configuration. And this real number will be this symmetric Euler characteristics. And it is defined as a difference of the Euler characteristic of the positive complex, which is this guy over here. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm taking the positive complex. Of course, it's closed complex. And I'm computing the Euler characteristic of this guy. So in this case, if I'm not mistaken, we should have 15 vertices, 22 edges, and 7 faces. And if we take an alternating sum of those numbers, we'll get zero. Okay, how about the negative complex, this uh, high minus? Again, what we are doing over here, we are taking the complex of the negative sp uh, spins, and uh, well, it's a closed complex, we can compute the Euler characteristic of it. If we count the number of vertices, we'll have 13 vertices, 17 edges, and 5 uh, two-dimensional cubes. Taking alternating sum give us 1. So, for that configuration, for the whole thing, the symmetrized Euler characteristic will be equal to 0, which is the value of the Euler characteristic for the positive complex, minus 1, which is the value of the Euler characteristic for the negative complex. And this is very obvious to see that if we actually s change all the plus uh, spins into the minus and vice versa, then the value of the symmetric Euler characteristic will get multiplied by minus 1. So we'll get something which is uh, not exactly invariant with respect to, to change of spines, change of spins, but um, well, it is invariant up to the absolute value, right? So if we change the spins, the high S will become minus high S. And that kind of reassembles, that rings a bell. It reassembles us another important constant 
in Ising model, which is called magnetization. Well, this magnetization is the number of positive vertices minus the number of negative vertices. And there is a constant over there, which uh, I will not be talking about for, for, uh, for the clarity of presentation. So, this uh, magnetization has exactly the same uh, property, namely if we swipe all the spines uh, or the spins, then um, the magnetization from being M will become minus M. Okay? But, you know, let's try to explore a bit further the link between magnetization and the positive Euler characteristics. So we have the formula, our symmetric Euler characteristic is the Euler characteristic of the positive complex minus the Euler characteristic of the negative one. And obviously we know that in two-dimensional case, the Euler characteristic of the positive complex is the number of positive vertices minus number of positive edges plus number of positive faces. Likewise, the negative Euler characteristic is number of negative vertices minus number of negative edges plus number of negative faces. And now, if we want to compute the symmetrized Euler characteristic, we just need to take you know, this thing over here and subtract the other one. And after grouping it together, we'll get the formula in which we have a number of positive vertices minus number of negative vertices. And this is precisely up to this constant scaling A magnetization which we've been talking about. But we have those additional terms, number of positive minus number of negative edges, number of positive faces minus number of negative faces. So we know that the value of this positive Euler characteristic, of the symmetric Euler characteristic is equal to magnetization plus this term over here, which is just something, something extra. Now, if you look at this from at the number of edges, positive edges minus number of negative edges, from the perspective of statistical physics, uh, you will see that this is something related to energy. And we, we haven't hammered out uh, down exactly what, what, what this is, it's still a work in progress, but we believe that this term is proportional to the energy of the configuration. And uh, looking at the combinatorics of those cubical complexes and this interlocked uh, positive and negative complexes, we can show that the two times this component is equal to, well, this component. Namely, if we take twice the difference between the number of positive faces minus the number of negative faces, we'll get exactly the number of positive edges minus the number of negative edges. And therefore, well, we can take this term and so substitute it with something related to the number of edges. Namely, that thing over here will be one half number of positive minus number of negative edges. And therefore, the whole rest, the, 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 the whole thing which is not the magnetization in this term, will become minus one half number of positive minus number of negative edges. And therefore, the symmetrized Euler characteristic, which we um, have introduced over here, it will become a sum of magnetization and possibly some energy-related um, term multiplied by, 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 by certain constant. Um, why this is important? Well, it is important because uh, we actually show a kind of correspondence between magnetization and energy, which are physical variables. And, uh, well, Euler characteristics of certain complexes. Now, Euler characteristics are also alternating sum of Betty numbers. So we have an equality in which on the left-hand side we have physical variables, and on the right-hand side we have purely topological. Uh, quantities. Um, this result is not re really restricted to dimension 2. We can show that for cubical grids, this symmetric Euler characteristic is equal to magnetization uh, plus a constant that depends on the dimension times a term that is related to energy. And that holds in every dimension. Again, Remember that at the same time, symmetric Euler characteristic is just an Euler characteristic of the positive complex minus the Euler characteristic of the negative complex. So the Euler characteristic of the positive complex is an alternating sum of Betty numbers of the positive complex. Likewise, the Euler characteristic for the negative complex. So we have a correspondence between physical variables, magnetization, and hopefully energy, and the topological variables, 
many numbers of certain interlocked complexes. And um, that is, first of all, quite important, but it is even better. We can actually look at the our, our symmetrized Euler characteristic and compute its average behavior for larger and larger configurations in different dimensions. And uh, we can try to estimate so-called critical exponents uh, for the symmetrized Euler characteristics. It turns out that it admits exactly the same critical behavior as magnetization. So our hypothesis, which we are writing down at the moment, is that the symmetrized Euler characteristic is a variable that admits exactly the same phase transition as um, the magnetization. And we are actually doing it properly, looking at uh, larger and larger configurations and trying to estimate growth of, cer of certain, uh, certain factors that are important in statistical physics. And um, so looking at the Ising model is one of the examples in which we can take topological tools and use it to understand physics. Um, why I think it's uh, important in case of Ising model? Well, first of all, for the Ising model itself, uh, we kind of have a unified story um, of what is happening topologically for instances regardless of the dimension. And um, if you look at the proofs of the uh, existence of the phase transition in Ising model, well, they are different for different dimensions. And over here we have something that, that unifies the, the story. So, so perhaps uh, those results may give certain hints about uh, how to prove rigorously that the uh, Ising model in dimension 3 actually admits a phase transition. Um, but from the perspective of computational topologists, I, I, I believe it, that there, there's an even better story over here. Because what we are able to show is that, well, we, we can look at physical variables, but we can look at certain topological variables. And this is really, really the same. Um, the bonus is that we can look at the topological variables without at least initially understanding physics. And uh, well, in this example, uh, this example shows that at least in, in simple model, simple but very common model, um, those two ways of looking at uh, Ising model configurations are the same. Okay, so let's so this part of the presentation showed us how we can use methods of topology to understand phases and phase transitions in different models. Um, now I would like to change gears and take it a, a step further. So, so now the question is, suppose we have a dynamics which is only given by, 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 by a finite sample. We don't have an analytical solution behind it. We, we may not know if it exists. The question is, can we use some simple ideas of topology and geometry in order to, to build a model which, which can be used for, for, for something? So thinking about mathematical modeling, uh, starting from the time of Isaac Newton, a huge amount of physical, chemical phenomena has been formalized and understood using mathematical modeling, typically using systems of ordinary or partial differential equations. And that development triggered a huge uh, leap for mankind. However, typical physical models they are based on, on very simple and well understood principles. And if there are any constants, like, like, like the gravitational constant, it can be measured with uh, a great precision. However, thinking about models in uh, many sciences, like, like biology, medicine, economical sciences, uh, potentially we can also write a system of equations um, that models them. However, in that case, it's much more difficult to measure the constants. Uh, <clears throat> Let me take an example. So, looking at the logistic equation, it's uh, probably the second uh, simplest model of the population growth, um, where, well, the size of the population is growing exponentially until certain capacity of the environment is uh, filled, and then 
well, the population with this derivative became negative because of this one minus x factor. So if the x, which is the size of the population, became too big, then the negative became the, the derivative became negative, and uh, the population started to shrink. And that's you know kind of so if you have once we have a small population, it has you know a lot of resources. It can grow in resources, and it can grow, it can grow exponentially. But once we, once we reach the, the capacity of the environment, it starts to shrink. So it's one of the simplest model you may get. And there's essentially only one parameter, which is this constant R, which is the, the reproduction rate uh, in the population. And um, depending on this constant R, we may have a very different bifurcation diagram. So the constant R in this case is um, <clears throat> available on the x-axis and uh, well so if r is say below 3 we have one um, fixed point and uh, this fixed point is attracting uh, be between 3 and 3.4 we have a period to orbit and one unstable fixed point but once we actually reach the constant r roughly equal 3.8 then we are starting to see this uh, well collection of orbits of as long period as, as as you wish, and the problem is if we are not able to capture this this constant r accurately, and if this constant happen to be large, happen to be in this chaotic regime, and even if we have a model which is one hundred percent accurate, because of inaccuracy in measurement of the certain constant, this uh, the fact that we know the, the equation is not helping us that much. And uh, quite typically in the biological sciences, those constants are not known with a great precision. Um, so what we'll try to do is, in instead of trying to write down a system of equations and trying to have our best educated guess for the constants, we'll try to build a model given directly from the data. And in this particular talk, I want to focus on the data which are coming uh, from the time series. So there are many time series we, we can take a look at, for instance, <clears throat> the time series for, from the financial market, like one, one of the stock indices, for instance, S&P 500 global index. We may look at uh, EEG data from human. We may look at fMRI data and uh, measuring the, the activities of neurons, etc., etc. The general problem is uh, that we have certain underlying dynamics. And we assume that this, this is a deterministic dynamics. However, we do not know the precise formula <coughs> that is driving it. So we are not trying to guess it. We don't know it. We assume that it exists. And we observe this dynamic only as a time series. And really you can think about it as a projection from some high dimensional, maybe infinite dimensional space uh, by some generic observation function, and that, that is our assumption, that observation function is generic, and we are obtaining a time series that is the signature of this dynamic. And from this time series, what we want to do is we want to do a reconstruction of some sort. And we want to ask the question, is, is there any theoretical reason to believe that whatever reconstruction we are going to make, it actually corresponds to the dynamics in, in, in some uh, way. So, when it comes uh, to a time series, we can think about a continuous time series where we really have a function from R to R, or a family of functions from R to R, or the discrete time series when we only have this function sampled in a finite uh, number of points. So, for the purpose of this talk, I just focus on one dimensional time series. And we'll have two aims. First of all, we would like to turn this time series into a discrete trajectory and then use the tools from topology to, to understand the dynamics of that trajectory. And in order to achieve the first aim, to actually uh, take the time series and get back a trajectory, we'll use a mechanism of the sliding window embedding. So suppose we have a continuous time series which is given by this curvy line over here. But, for the sake of argument, we assume that we only know it being sampled in these points x1, x2, 
I'll give it to x and x13. And um, we are going to turn this time series into a sequence of points, into a trajectory of points. The first point will be given by the value of the function at x1, followed by the value of the function at x2, etc., etc., followed by the function at x6. So it will be this point in a six-dimensional space. This is the, the initial point of our trajectory. The next one will be obtained when using exactly the same principle by just shifting our sliding window to the right by one unit. So this time our point will be f of x1, f of x2, f of x2, f of x3, all the way to f of x7. The third point will be f of x3, f of x4, all the way to f of xn. And we actually slide our window from left to right until we reach the end of the time series on the order of the data which are available to us. So in that case, we actually deduce a uh, kind of uh, connected sliding window. Nothing prevents us to, to, to have a sliding window which is disconnected, so we may actually take a look at um, the values at the x1, x3 and x5, for instance, and just shift the, the window by one, and that will also produce for us a discrete sampling of the trajectory. And um, maybe before we actually move further, let me just give you a, an intuition what this point coming from a sliding window is, is, is really telling us. Well, it really approximates the value of the function at, at you know, certain points. And uh, once you think about it, if we, if we have x1 and f of x1, x2, f of x2, x3, f of x3, all the way to x6, f of x6, then we can build various type of uh, interpolation of the function. We can interpolate it with uh, uh, partially linear lines, so essentially connect x1, f of x1 to x2, f of x2, then x2, f of x2 gets connected to x3, f of x3 by, by another line segment, etc., etc. Et uh, we can use Lagrange polynomials, we can use splines, but in general, this information, f of x1, f of x2, all the way to f of x6, somehow encodes the local shape of the function, or our time series, uh, between x1 to x6. Right? So, given a time series coming from applications, what we are going to do is to connect a sliding window embedding of the time series, so it will consist of a discrete trajectories. And the question is, can we relate those discrete trajectories to the trajectories of the original uh, dynamical system that was used, that, that actually give rise to our time series? Is there any hope to infer anything from our discrete observation about the, uh, you know, the thing that generates it? Right. And um, the answer is given by, by, by the Takens theorem from uh, 1980s, uh, which roughly says that once we have a, once we are given a chaotic dynamical system in Rn and a generic observation function in the sense that, well, if we are able to sample functions, um, if we are able to sample functions from the space of all possible sampling functions, then we'll get a generic function of probability one. Um, then essentially the dynamics can be reconstructed as a sliding window embedding of a single time series. But obviously the, 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 there, there are a few. So, so the, there is a theorem in general, um, but there are a few uh, important points that are kind of not specified by, by the theorem. So, so, you know, sliding window embedding have certain parameters, meaning the shape of the window, the size of the window, kind of directly corresponds also to the, the, the embedding dimension. And um, the theorem do not specify what are those parameters. It only states that uh, can be reconstructed using a sliding window embedding for certain collections of parameters. Also, we typically only deal with a finite amount of data and we are never guaranteed that this finite amount of data will allow uh, us to get what the theorem uh, states. 
But nevertheless, I, what, what, what I think is magical in the Dukkins and Benning theorem is that even if we have something extremely complicated in high dimensional space, then we still have all the information about it into one dimensional time series. For instance, take a chaotic dynamical system in R to the power 100 and take a time series of just one coordinate. If we are lucky, I mean, with probability 1, this time series can be reconstructed. Uh, this, whole, this dynamical system can be reconstructed by this time series of any coordinate you wish. But obviously, it can be also much more complicated. So as an example, let me take a, a trajectory sampled from Lawrence Attractor, so I just integrated it. For some time, not too long, I got this um, discrete trajectory. And if we look at the x-coordinate of the, this trajectory, we will get this plot, that will be the y-coordinate and the z-coordinate. And they do differ a little bit, but they are very, very strongly coupled, and that, that's kind of the main idea behind the uh, Takens and Benning theorem. So if we build three-dimensional sliding window embedding based on the x-coordinate, this is the trajectory we will get. It's not a standard butterfly attractor from the Lorentz system, but it's still diffeomorphic in a sense to it. Um, using y coordinate and using z coordinate, we are still getting something. Well, the z coordinate is, not, is problematic because we are not getting the uh, two unstable fixed point, and this is really this, this has something to do with the symmetry around the. Um, of the axis of, 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 the, of the whole system. So in that case, the projections to the z-coordinate is not a generic observation function. So what does it mean? It means that once we are giving sufficiently long sample of, 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 of the time series, then we can reconstruct the whole dynamics. And um, other than uh, the uh, parameters of the sliding window embedding, we don't take any assumptions about the models. We don't need to fix any parameters, but we can reconstruct the dynamics. Okay, so if the Takens theorem <coughs> tells us that we can reconstruct the whole dynamics from the sliding window embedding of a time series, which is given by a uh, generic observation function of the dynamics, then in principle, we can also uh, reconstruct all the invariant sets um, from those time series. Such invariant sets, such fixed points, periodic trajectories, connections between fixed point or trajectories, etc. And for the first instance, let us concentrate on the, the periodic orbits and uh, try to understand how they manifest itself into the time series. So, let me take a stereotypical um, periodic function as the sign in this case and um, <clears throat> let us actually try to do a sliding window embedding of that function. So suppose we start with a window position somewhere here. Once we shift it all the way through um, to the position over here, what will happen is that we'll have a point correspond to that shape of a function and then we'll capture all the different intermediate shapes until we actually get back to the same, same shape um, to pi away to the right. So if we really interpret it in the terms of uh, point cloud in this uh, high dimensional space in which our uh, sliding window embedding um, maps the, the, this time series, then we'll see a certain point over here and then we'll move out of this point when going over here, eventually we will, we will come back to the same point from a different direction, ending up somewhere here. So, what we'll see will be a, a periodic orbit, and actually you can, you can get such a picture by doing a sliding window embedding or a time delay embedding of a sign, and embed it, embed it for instance, to a three-dimensional space. We can take it further and we can actually make a mapper plot. In this case, what I did was to 
do a sliding window embedding to 10 dimensional space, do a mapper plot, in this case a ball mapper plot, of the obtained point cloud and the coloration is coming from the time. So, um, well, quite likely those points over here, which is bluish, are coming first and then we are moving along the trajectory and then actually the color is describing how we are moving along the trajectory. And that actually also brings an important message. So, so if we have a uh, <clears throat> periodic time series, that means that the sliding window embedding will be will be cyclic, and uh, this observation is used in in the, in the, in the number of software packages to, to actually detect periodicity. Because if we have a periodic time series, then because of the reasoning which I which I have mentioned back here on that slide, we'll see that uh, the sliding window embedding will be cyclic. And if it is cyclic, then we can detect it using one-dimensional persistent homology. So, again, the, the, what we have is an implication. If a time series is periodic, then we have a long-living um, generator in dimension one uh, persistent homology. Uh, however, the reverse statement is not true. Even if we are able to find a high persistence generator in dimension one, then it do not imply a periodicity of, of, of the series. And, and here is a simple counterexample to that question, uh, to, to the statement. So, so if we take a, the following function, when we have a hill up, let me call this part a hill up, and we, we take a hill down, and we have two constitutive hill ups and hill down, three constitutive hill ups and the hill down, and it will be followed by four constitutive hill ups and hill down, etc. etc. If we actually do a sliding window embedding of that thing, we'll get you know this, this cycle with a bar in the middle. And obviously, it will have a high persistence um, generator in dimension one, two to be precise. Um, however, obviously, that time series is not. Periodic, and um, well, that, that's that's kind of a word of to, to be a little careful when using this machinery. We, it's only it's a necessary condition, but it is not a sufficient condition. That well, once we have a high persistence generator in dimension one, then our time series is periodic. Um, but you know, when speaking about persistent homology of the sliding window embedding, it's also used by by, by, by a number of groups to actually try to understand different types of dynamics. So, so what they are doing is they are starting from time series, do the sliding window embedding, and actually look at the persistent homology through various uh, lenses of machine learning and try to distinguish different types of, of dynamics. And that, that's by far one of the possible directions for, for instance, uh, <coughs> explored by, by Lismung. Um, what I'm going to speak about is, 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 is a little bit different and uh, well well actually it, it will be more related to idea of a mapper rather than a persistent homology so kind of to, to, to wrap up the, this this connection between uh, high dimensional persistent homology uh, generators and and one end and uh, periodicity of the time series let, let me highlighted once more. So periodicity implies cyclicity of the point cloud obtained as a sliding window. Um, and once we have a cyclicity that we should observe the dominant interval in one dimensional persistent homology. Um, but the other application is not, uh, doesn't hold. So uh, what we need to have in order to uh, observe a period to, to actually quantify the periodicity to prove the periodicity of the time series by using a sliding window and bending. Well, we need to see a periodic orbit. Namely, not only we need to have a dominant inter uh, generator in the one dimensional homology, we actually need to see that the trajectory is moving periodically around that generator. So, to actually um, reference to, to this example, well. What will happen over here is uh, we make a full cycle going up hill and downhill. That's a full cycle. 
But the moment we actually move from uphill to uphill again, we are moving only on this one, one end, uh, one, one side of, 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 this, of this, let's say, figure eight uh, figure. So what happens over here is, uh, as we move along, we are moving around, then we are making a half of the turn and we are going on the shortcut when moving to the second uphill and uh, then well move once we are moving up here again we move half away uh, along the cycle and the moment once we move down we take the other turn then we move up we take another turn but instead of moving down and completing the cycle we are moving up so we are taking a shortcut so what is happening over here is we are moving around the, the big cycle but uh, then when the parallel city is, is, is disrupted we are moving around the shorter cycle and obviously this is not a periodic orbit so the question is once we have a sliding window and bending how we can actually uh, provide some additional evidence that we have a periodic orbit and um, uh, deliberately i don't want to say how, how we want to prove that, that this is a periodic orbit because what we are doing over here is just we are making observation for a finite sample. So 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 we, we, can, we can have some evidences for the hypothesis that this is a periodic orbit, but we won't be able to prove it using a finite amount of data. However, let us think about the possible strategies that can be employed in order to show uh, to, to gather some additional evidences that we have a periodic orbit and in order to do this let me start from a you know continuous periodic orbit very nice and, and round over here um, what we'll have in the dynamical sense uh, when we are dealing only with the finite amount of data is we'll have a finite sample of points somewhere close to that orbit so so, so we, we we kind of expect that there will be a little bit of noise involved in the process of sampling and um, well, those points will also be attached. Will have attached a timestamp, so 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 a time in which actually the edit enters the the uh, the point cloud. So it's not just a point cloud; it is actually a point cloud with the points decorated with the time. So conceptually, what I'm going to do will be very similar to the ball mapper approach that I have been developed. I will start by selecting a subset of so-called landmark points that are kind of uniformly sampled across my point cloud. In that case, uh, I will require that they form so-called epsilon net for the reasonable choice of the parameter epsilon. And uh, given the landmark points A, B, C and D, I will want to construct a Voronoi decomposition of my point cloud. Namely, every point will get attached to the closest among A, B, C or D. So that will probably be the decomposition we had in mind. Starting the points labeled as A, and then the points labeled as D, over here points labeled as B, and right in here, points labeled as C. Now, let us bring dynamics back into the picture. If we have a trajectory going clockwise along this uh, periodic trajectory, then if we forget about the points, but only look at the labels coming from A, B, C, or D, then we'll see probably a sequence of A's followed by the sequence of D's, which is later followed by the sequence of B's and C's. And then the sequence repeats itself. We have A's again, D's, B's and C's. Now, if we take a number of, if we see a number of uh, letters, symbols of the same type next to each other, we can just compress them into one symbol. And uh, once this compression is done, We'll get a symbolic dynamics saying a d b c and then repeating itself over and over again and this symbolic dynamics is an evidence of the existence of the periodic orbit that we wanted to explore moreover looking at 
the sequences of points, of symbols, as they progress, as we progress through the trajectory, we see that when we are in the symbol A, then eventually we'll get to the symbol D, and when our trajectory is in the symbol D, then eventually it will get to B, and then to C, and then to A again. And by, doing, by, by making this observation, we kind of formalize this observation using these graphs of dynamics, <coughs> which is a clear cyclic graph that gives us an indication that we are dealing with something periodic over here. So, this is all very close to uh, spectral metals. Um, and uh, we may be asking the question, well, if we know that um, a periodic function, periodic time series, will give rise to, 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 to periodic trajectory in the sliding window, um, perhaps we shouldn't be building the dynamics, but instead use the spectral methods, which are, which are standard, uh, in order to detect the if we are dealing with periodic signals or not. And um, by all means, this is possible. In many cases, uh, spectral methods are very well suited to answer this type of questions. There are also a number of instances where topological methods have an upper hand over the spectral ones. So, let me take a look on a few processes um, coming from the nature, which uh, can be used as an example. Over here we see a time series of the minimal daily temperature in Melbourne across nine years. And um, if we try to use state-of-the-art uh, spectral methods, it is not that trivial to recover a simple fact that um, a year has 365 days. Topological methods, on the other hand, is, gives clear indication that there is a period of uh, something between 300 and 370 days. But noisy data is not the only case where topological methods may actually give an interesting insight. Let's think about uh, wheels in our car when we drive it. Obviously, the velocity, the annular velocity of our wheels is changing depending on the traffic condition, depending on the speed we are driving. And um, over here we have an example of a function which is uh, periodic when restricted to the proper uh, subintervals in the domain. But it is not periodic as a function per se. And um, therefore, using standard spectral methods on the whole thing will not give us any interesting insight. We need to first decompose the domain into the periodic pieces and only subsequently we can use Fourier analysis. However, using topological methods do not require this type of decomposition. We can directly apply um, a sliding window embedding and uh, what we shall get will be a dynamic graph of this sort where we clearly see three different periodic orbits appearing in our data. If we take a step further and actually look at the point cloud embedded to 50-dimensional space um, and use ball mapper graph with the coloration being the time, we'll see three different periodic orbits as they appear um, when the times move by. So, this picture was uh, obtained when looking at the 50-dimensional embedding with the radius equal 3 for the ball mapper. If we take <coughs> even higher dimensional embedding, we can get a clearer picture of the periodic orbits and the trajectories in between them. But that's not the only situation where 
topological methods uh, can give some reasonable insight. Let's think about a function that is periodic, but the, the, the period is changing. So um, what we have over here is a sine of f of x, where f of x is a linear function that is uh, well, very, very close to, to, to being y equals x, but it's well growing a little bit faster, just a little bit faster. And as a consequence, what, what we have over here is a sign of a period that is increasing as we move along the x-axis. And once again, this is not a periodic function per se, because the period is not uh, well defined. However, if we do the time delay embedding of such function, uh, we'll get an image like this. Let me actually show you an animation. So what, what we are looking at is a, a two-dimensional, or something that looks like a two-dimensional color, and the trajectory is actually moving ar around it, and then it's actually drifting into a space, still forming something uh, which is nicely well connected. So this is a ball mapper image colored by time, of 100 dimensional trajectory. So we can, using this reconstruction algorithm, to recover both the cases where we have this continuously changing or continuously changing period, and that has certain interpretation. Let's think about other defects, effects we may have. Let's think about damping. So th this is a typical situation where you have a phys physical pendulum. Uh, you let it go, but after some time it actually stops because of the damping effect. In that case, again, the period is quite well defined. The amplitude is not. And um, what we have is a periodic orbit that is converging into a fixed point. If we do a sliding window embedding, of that thing. Um, say to three-dimensional space, you can probably see it. We have you know a spiral spiraling in into the center. If we do a bone mapper plot, well we start somewhere somewhere over here, but then um, the diameter gets smaller and smaller. We don't see a point where it actually stops. But we see this drifting of the, from a periodic orbit into a fixed point. When we look at the, the dynamics graph of that, well, first we are moving on the big cycle, but then the cycle is getting gradually smaller and smaller as the damping effect is taking place. So we can say something about periodic orbits in the underlying dynamics just by looking at a time series of a generic observation function. And uh, this really corresponds to, to, to periodic functions, but we can say so much more. We, 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 can, we can speak about change of period, we, we, we can speak about various phenomena like, like, like damping. Um, but other invariant sets are also possible to, to detect. We can, we can detect fixed points. This is kind of easy, it corresponds to, to, to a constant time series, but we can look at the connections between fixed points, we, we can uh, speak about general invariant sets that would correspond to a subregion of the dynamic graph in which trajectory is trapped in after some time. Um, and again, what we can say is only as good as the time series we have at the input. But this machinery, by combining Tuckens embedding theorem, and the, the, the simple ideas from computational geometry, computational topology, allows to reconstruct symbolic dynamics. Now, let us go back to Lorentz system. So, so let, let me take a trajectory from a Lorentz system and let me try to infer some information about it by using the machinery I just described to you. So, coming back to Lorentz, let me take one of the generic observation functions and do the reconstruction. It's the dynamic graph that we'll obtain. So we clearly see uh, 
the one orbit around um, one of the unstable fixed point and another one and the place in the middle when the transitioning is happening. Um, now we can take this graph and simplify it um, by uh, joining the vertices that are mutually correct, connected. We get a simplified version and then each of this path can be further simplified because, well, once we have a trivial path, um, it can be compressed into something simpler. And we'll get a model of a trajectory that really resembles what's going on in the Lorentz system. Um, so this model tells us that when we are in the neighbor, neighborhood of landmark number two, then we'll end up in landmark number three. Then we can go back to go back to landmark number one, but then we have a choice either to go to landmark number two or landmark number six and continue on the other side of the orbit. But as you think about it, this graphs uh, gives you a little bit more information, namely we not only know where we are with a trajectory at the moment, we do know our history. We know which landmarks have been crossed on the way here. And um, those additional landmarks of history, uh, I like to think about them as additional bits of information about where we are. Let me be a little bit more specific. Um, once we are in the certain ball, in the certain Voronoi cell, that's typically an object of a non-trivial size. So we, we do not know specifically where we are. However, adding the information about the history of the trajectory allows to localize ourselves much better within this ball. And um, so let's try to ask a question. Suppose that we have this history uh, how many potential futures of the trajectory there exist. And uh, everything I'm going to say is really based on a certain, not too long part of the trajectory of the Lorentz system. If you actually integrate it for long enough, then those conclusions will not hold anymore because the, uh, the entropy, well, kicks in. But for that piece of trajectory, which we saw in the picture, let's actually consider the following problem. Let's suppose that I know lowercase n uh, landmarks that has been crossed by the trajectory until a central point, and I want to predict uppercase n points to follow. Just to give you a reference, uh, so the trajectory stays within each landmark for roughly 20 integration steps. All right, so we have lowercase n landmark points of the history, and I want to predict uppercase n of the following points. And uh, let me plot the histogram for a given n lowercase n points. Uh, how many potential futures of the size uppercase n there exist? So, here is a connection graph with no simplification, and here is the histogram. And what does it mean? Well, it means that given 10 points of the history, there are roughly 175 possible trajectories of the length 100, so 100 following up uh, landmark points. The most frequent one appears roughly 80 times. Uh, Typically, you know, we, we have uh, the futures of the length um, that appears 20 times. Um, so it really says that even if we know one, even if we know 10 points of our history, at this in this restricted case, it quite well determine our quite distant future. Um, and uh, then perhaps make another one more remark. So, um, two trajectories are different if they are different at even at one landmark point. So, um, 
if we actually consider similar or close geometrically um, trajectories, this number will be far less restricted. So, given the 10 landmark points of the history, we can have a reasonable grasp of the future of the next 1000 points that we are going to visit. If we instead take 20 points of the history and still want to predict the 1000 points that follows, there are only 29 possible different uh, sequences. And um, again, the frequency is going down as, uh, as the plot indicates. If we allow 30 points of the history, so assume that we know 30 points of our history, we want to preserve the next 1000 points, there are only nine possible uh, different futures. And with 40, we are quite well restricted. So, so let me wrap up the discussion. What we are trying to do in the second part of the talk is to provide a directed graphs that can be used as the models of the dynamics based on the observed data. We are not trying to write a global model. Instead, based on the observations, we are trying, simply trying to infer where the trajectory may go. Because we are not having any models, we don't have to infer constants. Um, and therefore, well, we can only observe, but we cannot provide guarantees of existence of certain invariant sets. At the moment, we are working on uh, some hypothesis testing based approach that potentially can allow us to use machinery of statistics to give certain guarantees to the conclusions we may have. As we saw, at least given a finite um, time series, we can make some predictions of the future of the future evolution of the trajectory that could potentially can be used. We haven't tested extensively, but this is something we are trying to do. What, I'm, what I have reported so far is an approach that works reasonably well on a reasonably well, nice selection of toy examples. So I want to conclude over here. Um, at the same time, I would like to say a few words about uh, the Dioscuri Center in Topological Data Analysis that I am establishing right now at the Mathematical Institute of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. We are interested in uh, applied project, project, projects in uh, the intersection of topology, dynamics, data science and applications. If you would like to talk to me about some of the ideas related in this talk and also some other ideas related to topological data analysis and other applications of mathematics, please feel free to drop me an email, talk to me on Skype, also feel free to visit our web, web page on dioscuri-tda.org. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.